Money, of course, is merely a technology by which we transport value over time and space. And without it, our species would have to consume in the present everything that it produces. Uh, most species do. They have to eat what they kill right away, lest it be stolen or spoiled. Uh, sure, squirrels can squirrel away a little bit, uh, a good habit the government should learn from, but <laughs> most species have to use it or lose it. We developed a technology that would allow two people who are exchanging things uh, to go ahead with their exchange even if each did not have the ability to supply the other with something that the other wanted. They could simply use this technology called money in order to transport the value between each other across time and around different geographies. And so over time, money has taken many forms. In uh, one uh, South Pacific island, it was just a ledger carved on scarce, uh, scarce limestone. In some places, it's been beads or seashells. In prisons, they use cigarettes. In school, they used to use candy when I was a kid. The, throughout history, it became a metal, some precious, some brute. We had gold, we had silver, we had copper. Many different means of translating value across space and time have been used. But politicians have, uh, have found it a nuisance to pay their bills using money with integrity. You know, because back in 1215, Poor old King John was forced by the barons and the commoners to sign this nuisance of a document called the Magna Carta, the Great Charter. And in that document uh, was inscribed the principle that the crown could not tax what the people had not approved. And that principle is still in place here in this parliament today. Government can't spend what we don't vote on. Uh, 800 years later. And you look around and see the beautiful green here. You know where that comes from, of course. It's because that was the, the color of the fields in which King John uh, was made low. And it, that green should remind everyone that the people in the fields who are actually doing the work, they're the ones that produce the money that we spend around here. That might have been a better answer in the committee than uh, a government's broader macroeconomic framework, uh, Mr. Speaker. But I digress. But you see what happened after King John was uh, prevented from going on uh, taxing what uh, people had not approved. Well, he was forced to go back to the commoners to get their permission to take their money. He and his successors would become increasingly uh, um, creative in sourcing the cash that they acquired. Years later, uh, King Henry VIII, who is more famous for clipping off the heads of his subjects decided that he could get his hands on money by clipping coins. He and his regime would clip off the edge of the coin and that way they could melt those edges down and make more coins. And back then it was hard to make coins because it was the British pound which was a pound of silver. And by clipping off a piece you could melt it down and create more coins and John could inflate the, the value of, of, of currency in his hands thereby deflating the value of the wages that his, his peasant class earned. He got even more creative later on, um, and uh, this is how he got his famous nickname. He would actually have his minters melt down the, the, the British pound, and he would re-mint it with just a tiny coat of silver around the, uh, the outside of a copper coin. So people would think they were getting a silver coin, meanwhile on the inside what they actually got was copper. The problem is, being the egomaniac that he was, facing outward from the coin, he didn't want a profile shot, he, his face was on the coin and it stared everyone in the eye when they looked at that coin. But his nose protruded the farthest out and when it was in people's pockets it would rub against the inside of the pocket and the silver would, would scrape off the tip of his nose, meaning that you have a silver <laughs> coin with a red nose and thus he got the nickname Old Copper Nose. And every time someone saw that red copper nose they knew the king had stolen the real value of their money. Throughout time other politicians have found other creative ways. Uh, 
Um, the, uh, the, emp the dictator Dionysius, uh, who was a Greek dictator in, the, in Syri uh, Syracuse, he actually took all the coins, the one drachma coins, and he stamped them with a two. So all of a sudden he had twice as much money. Now I, I hesitate to tell that story in this house because I worry that this Prime Minister might think that he could do the same. You know, if you run out of money, if, if you run out of money, he'll say, you can always get more. You'll turn loonies to toonies and toonies to fours. That might be the next creative idea uh, by which government could get its hands on money. And throughout uh, the 20th century, we saw uh, this same tactic of cash creation. In, of course, uh, with the fa most famous example was in the early 1920s in Germany. Uh, they had created so many uh, new uh, uh, units of account that inflation ran rapid out of control. You needed to have a wheelbarrow full of cash in order to buy a loaf of bread. And if you got to the bar to try and drink away your inflationary blues, blues, you ordered all your beer at the beginning of the night because as the minutes went on, it became more expensive. And uh, of course, uh, we in this part of the world have not been immune to this inflationary disease ourselves. Um, while the, um, the post-war era we inherited monstrous debts fighting the fascists, but governments had hard money from the end of the, night of the, the war until the early 70s. So they basi we basically operated on an American-led standard whereby you could, if you had a U.S. greenback, you could exchange it uh, at a rate of $35 per ounce of gold. And in that period, of course, we had an enormous amount of prosperity. The Americans paid off their war debts. Here in Canada, with solid currency, we wrestled the inflationary beast to the ground in the post-war era. We took our record debts for, that we inherited from the war. We paid them off. We increased the size of the Canadian economy by 300%. And by 1933, we had basically become a debt, uh, 1973, we had basically become a debt-free country. But then what happened in the 1970s? Well, President Nixon wanted to spend on warfare and welfare. Of course, the Americans were bogged down in Vietnam, which was costly an enterprise, and President Nixon wanted to keep his popularity at home, so he decided to spend, spend, spend. And in the, the decade that followed 1971, not only did they unleash the American dollar from any particular standard, but they increased the number of U.S. dollars in circulation by 150 percent, while output only grew by about 39 percent. In other words, the amount of money grew about four times faster than the amount of underlying output that that money represented. Now, here in Canada, we had Pierre Elliott Trudeau, and he looked down at all the inflation that the U.S. government was creating. They had reached double-digit inflation down there, a total inflationary crisis. The American dollar was devalued on an international basis and, of course, was incapable of buying affordable petroleum on the world market. They liked to blame OPEC, but they took no responsibility for the fact that the unit with which they were buying oil on the international markets was itself devalued. So Trudeau says, he looks down at all the misery in the United States. He looked at how people were lined up at gas stations trying to, to, to wait for an hour and a half in order to gas up their cars. He saw the poverty that was overtaking inner city streets. He saw the expanding wealth gap in the United States of America. And what did Pierre Elliott Trudeau say to all that? He said, let's have some of that up here. And so he started printing some money uh, here in Canada and massively increased the money supply uh, with which uh, Canada, I just have the data right here. Between 1971 and 1981, the money supply in Canada grew by over 200 percent, while GDP only grew in real terms by about 47 percent. So you can imagine, money is growing in supply at more than four times the rate as the economy is growing. So you have more dollars chasing fewer goods, and what do you get? Inflation. That's right. That is, we learned that, all of us, we learned that in grade school, but apparently some lessons need to be 
learned and relearned here in this House of Commons. <laughs> <laughs>